Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And I'll continue now where we left off yesterday in the book, The Footprints of the Jesuits by R.W. Thompson. We're talking about a period of time when Italy wants to liberate itself from the temporal power of the Pope. They wish to continue to regard him as the head of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, but they don't want any more papal oppression. No more meddling in the government. The people think themselves capable of governing themselves, of electing their own government, and having a government similar to that of the United States and the other liberated countries throughout Europe, who had likewise shed the yoke of bondage of the papacy and sought their own way in the world. And the papacy has solicited the help of Austria, foreign military power, to bring this so-called revolution to a halt. And things have become very, very uh, dangerous in Italy at this time, and the revolutionists have taken a pause. Now, we continue on page 289 of the book, the second full paragraph, about the middle of the page, if you're following along. It says, Events now move slowly from necessity, requiring circumspect and cautious management. The provisional governments were kept in abeyance at Bologna, Parma, Medina, and elsewhere to await developments. A period of difficulty and doubt ensued, during which new combinations were formed, all, however, pointing to a constitution as the grand object to be achieved. Italy wants their own constitution. They want the Pope to butt out of their civil affairs. And since the Pope is threatening them with a, a military, uh, a military uh, uh, attack from Austria, they've taken somewhat of a pause, never compromising at all in their efforts to achieve their own constitution. But having to deal with the imminent threat of Austria, who intends to defend the Pope's temporal power, to keep the Pope the king of, uh, of Italy, in commensurate with uh, the Holy Alliance, a union of the papacy, the papal monarchs, the principal of which was Prince Metternich of Austria, all in defense of the divine right monarchy, which they share with the Pope. And all of this was assisted by the Jesuits. So you have the papacy, the Jesuits, and the monarchs all gaining uh, alliance and ganging up on these, on these, patriot, these patriotic Italians who wish to have, form their own government. Now, it says, the circle of revolutionary influence is gradually enlarged, almost reaching the muzzles of the Austrian guns. The Pope was forced to realize, evidently to his surprise, that the populations would not accept the doctrines of his encyclical as part of their religious faith, and that if maintained at all, it could be done only by military force. Now, remember, the Pope this case, Gregory the Sixteenth issued a papal encyclical making it a matter of religious faith in the Roman Catholic Church, the acceptance of the monarchies as the legitimate divine right rule of Italy and the papal states and all of Roman Catholic Europe. This encyclical went out to all the world, as all encyclicals do. They're addressed to Roman Catholics and to all the peoples of the earth. A papal encyclical carries with it the, the aura of papal infallibility. And here in this encyclical, the Pope informs the world that no government is legitimate unless... It is monarchical in fashion and answers to the Pope. 
Now it says, he therefore induced the Austrian army to invade the states where provisional governments had been formed. This was an actual military invasion of Italy by an alien army in obedience to the requirements of the Pope, an offense for which no apology has been or can be discovered. The Pope solicited the help of the military might of Austria to maintain his temporal power in Italy, and he never did apologize for it. He was against this popular form of government that the Italians wished to create for themselves because it would have overthrown his temporal power. It would have separated the silver key from the golden key on the papal flag. It would have resulted in bloodshed, as it always does, and the papacy has made it perfectly clear he is more than willing and able to shed the blood of these rebellious Italians for for attempting to assemble their own form of government. Now, it says it was successful, of course, and a military garrison was established in Ferrara, whereupon Gregory XVI reestablished his own arbitrary pontifical authority under Austrian protection. Okay? So the papal proxy warrior, Austria, the leader of the Holy Alliance, Prince Metternich represented the monarchs of Europe, in union with the papacy, defended the temporal power of the Pope, and attempted to overthrow the rebellious, uh, the rebels in Italy. Now it says papal edicts were accordingly issued, denouncing the revolution as irreligious and condemning the insurgents as heretics. The crisis grew more serious every day. Pacification seemed out of the question. Nothing but absolute and passive submission would suffice, would, would satisfy the Pope. Gary, I, you know, this, we must comprehend this. That the papacy is built upon a foundation of tyranny. The Pope, who claims himself to be the vicar, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, demands complete, absolute, and passive submission by every man, woman, and child on the planet. And if they can't get it voluntarily, they will use military force to get it, as in this case. I want my listeners to realize this just explains all the wars of the world. The wars of the world are fought to maintain the Pope's temporal power, not just on Catholics, but on Protestants, on Orthodox Catholics and on Muslims, and as in the case of the, uh, the book Vietnam, Why Did We Go? by Avro Manhattan, even upon the Buddhists in, in uh, Vietnam, the Pope declares himself to be the governor of the world, the divine right governor of the world. And the wars of the world are fought for the same purpose as Austria has been brought to Italy to defend the papal power, to extend the Pope's dominions, and to increase him and elevate him to an eventual global reign. Now, it says the public mind was in a state of extreme agitation. Terror seized upon some, but the multitude remained courageously resolved not to stop short of a constitution. Old men found themselves infused with new life, and vigorous and enthusiastic young men were stimulated by the idea of a new Italy, free, independent, and united. Under the watchword of Young Italy, the revolutionists soon obtained footing in Lombardy, Genoa, Tuscany, and even in the states of the church, the papal states. Resolute and immediate action was demanded by those who were burning with fervid patriotism. But prudential considerations dictated extreme caution. The questions, when and where to strike, involved too much to be decided hastily. The presence of the Austrians alone prevented a popular uprising. 
They stood guard over the dispersed bands of Italian patriots while Pope Gregory XVI was allowed to gather material for their annihilation. Such a scene has not often been witnessed, and men of all nations turned their eyes toward it with anxiety. Thoughtful and intelligent people everywhere, especially in the United States, among Roman Catholics as well as Protestants, sent words of encouragement and cheer to those patriot, th these patriotic and struggling masses, congratulating them upon having man manfully resolved not to receive either their form of government or their religion from the points of Austrian bayonets. Now, this is R.W. Thompson's take, and certainly, on no doubt, there were people in the United States who saw this revolution taking place in Italy and were overjoyed that these people were going to enjoy the same liberties that we enjoy here in the United States. R.W. Thompson acknowledges these people, but what he fails to recognize here at this point was at the same time, the Roman Catholic hierarchy in the United States of America was trying to solicit help from American Roman Catholics to condemn the revolutionists of Italy, being appalled that they would dare try to usurp the, the, the rightful divine right authority of the Pope to be the governor of the country. Another author that we read whose name uh, seems to escape me at the moment makes perfect mention of this, that there was an active movement among the Roman Catholic hierarchy and in the churches and in assemblies of Roman Catholics to gather support for the Pope and the Austrian armies. So, and, and the, the author in question makes these points in order for us to Stop and think a moment what these Roman Catholics in America would do if a revolution ever took place in this country. With whom would they side? Obviously, the Pope. And that there is a, a, a vast wing of the Roman Catholic Church in America led by these Roman Catholic hierarchy in America that would do all in their power to overthrow the Constitution of the United States, if they possibly could, and make the United States succumb to papal tyranny, just like they wanted in Italy. So it bears repeating, while R.W. Thompson gives credit to Protestants and Catholics in this country who supported the, rebel, uh, the revolution in Italy, we have to remember that there was also just as many Catholics led by the priesthood, the, the, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, who were opposed to these rebels as they saw them. Rebels against the legitimate power of the papacy. Imagine why the question was asked by this previous author, what would these Catholics do? In this country, what is their purpose in this country? Are they not a fifth column for the overthrow of our own constitution? If they want to prevent the Italians from establishing their own constitution and shaking loose the iron chains of papal tyranny, what would they do in this country? Do not they also, do not they form a fifth column for the overthrow of our constitution and bill of rights? The answer is obvious. If they, if they defended monarchism against these liberal rebels in, Ital in Italy, would they not do the same here in the United States if given an opportunity? And it's these same priest-led Roman Catholics that occupy the highest offices in our government. Their intent is to gradually overthrow the Constitution of the United States by getting the United States bound in treaties with United Nations, global government powers, which renders the government of the United States uh, inoperable, being bound by treaties that usurp the authority of, of the elected government of the country and put it in the laps of global governors like the United Nations. 
It's the overthrow of the Constitution of the United States that they are motivated by. And I want my listeners to know that these global organizations like the United Nations are simply servants of the Pope. So the United States is being attacked by a fifth column of Roman Catholics in high government offices that are throwing the jurisdiction of, 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 uh, uh, this country into the governing body of the Pope, the United Nations. They're not engaged in an open revolution to overthrow the government. That would be a, a, a provocation that would likely result in their annihilation. But they are binding us to, co- to, to agreements and treaties of, of a global nature that simply takes power away from our government and renders the Constitution just a piece of paper. Now, <clears throat> continuing, he says, they were inspired not alone by general sympathy, but by the examples of their religious brethren in other parts of Europe. Besides the revolution in France and Belgium, which they had imitated from the beginning, the events transpiring in Portugal and Spain proved to them that their cause could become hopeless only by ignominious surrender. Shameless surrender. I mean, Spain and Portugal had already proven that successful revolution against the papacy was a possibility. And all they had to do was maintain their course. And their liberty was assured if they maintained that course, unreservedly. And that the only way that the the Pope could have gained once again the upper hand in Portugal and Spain was if they just shamefully surrendered to the Pope. Now, <clears throat> ignominious su- surrender. That's the only way they could have been defeated. What light does that shed on the ecumenical movement? Ignominious surrender. That's what the ecumenical movement was. We, we've got liberty from the Pope in this country. At least on the face of things, we do. But the ecumenical movement was an ignominious, a shameful surrender to the temporal power of the Pope. The ecumenical movement to unite the Protestants back under the temporal and spiritual authority of the Pope was nothing short of an ignominious surrender. Surrender without a fight. There was no threat from the papacy. No real threat that the Pope could have exercised in this country against the Protestants. But through subtle persuasion, twisted reasoning, this Vatican Council, too, persuaded the Protestants to just ignominiously surrender to the papacy. I mean, Catholics have more brains than that. Spain had more brains than that. So did Portugal and France and Belgium, but not the United States. We just laid down our Bibles and our brains, and we just made bacon with the whore of Rome. That's what we did. And the Pope is capitalizing on that surrender and is now controlling the government. It bears repeating, I know this must seem monotonous to some of my listeners, especially the regular ones, but the Pope doesn't just represent the card-carrying Catholics in this country, roughly 25% of the population. No, now he represents also the ecumenical evangelical bellies who have ignominiously surrendered. And that, my friends, is over a majority of the population of this country. The Pope now believes that he represents all Christians in this country. And when his prelates and priests and Jesuits walk in to Washington, D.C., the halls of government, they carry with them a mandate. And our government responds to that mandate and gives them whatever they want, even foreign wars, as in the case of the Gulf War, the Iraq War. The United States has now taken the role of Austria and putting down rebellion against the papacy all over the world. 
That's what we got when we got Vatican Council II. You think the Pope was just going to be satisfied being the spiritual head of America? No, he's going to be the temporal king as well. And by this mandate that was handed to him by the the ecumenical evangelical bellies, he carries that temporal sword now in the United States, and it's enforced by our own government. And even by the Federal Communications Commission, because when I talk about these things on amateur radio, the Federal Communications Commission stands back, stands aloof, stands silent and inactive when hordes of Roman Catholic amateur radio operators jam and maliciously interfere with my transmissions so that people cannot hear what I'm telling them. It's the job of the Federal Communications Commission to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And in order to maintain free speech on amateur radio, constitutionally protected free speech on amateur radio, they are to move and take action against those who violate my free speech by maliciously and intentionally interfering with those transmissions. But the FCC just stands back and listens to it all happen. And complaining doesn't even get a response. That's the extent to which our government is controlled by this right-wing, as some people call it, papal mandate. The government no longer upholds the Constitution of the United States, especially not on ham radio. Now, he continues, he says, In Portugal, revolution had ended in civil war and the complete subjugation of the retrogressive papal party, the suppression of the Jesuits, and the confiscation of their property. This is Roman Catholic Portugal. They kicked the Pope out of their public affairs. They completely stopped the retrogressive monarchical move to restore monarchy in in Portugal, and they kicked the Jesuits out and confiscated all their property. You think the United States would ever come up with a solution like that? Protestant USA? You think the Protestant USA would ever recognize who their real enemies are? and then take action to do something about it, like Roman Catholic Portugal did, would to God that the American people would finally listen. We'll talk more about this on uh, after the break. You're listening to the Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. 
Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicholas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, Don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin, Rapture Origin, the seven-year tribulation, Deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America, in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. One hundred days, one hundred subscribers at seven dollars will bring FirstAmendmentRadio.com to the minimum level necessary to sustain it through 2015. Go to support.firstamendmentradio.com. Seven dollars a month. Really, you can afford that for our Protestant First Amendment rights and the Gospel of the Kingdom message. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Go to support. Support.firstamendmentradio.com Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you approve of First Amendment Radio or Inquisition Update and would like to see it remain on the air, please support Inquisition Update by supporting First Amendment Radio who sponsors the program. We thank Brother Nicholas for seeing the value of the information that we present here and uh, covering the bills out of his own pocket. And uh, I hope the listeners will help carry the load and uh, make Inquisition Update a real viable contributor here on First Amendment Radio. Please support Inquisition Update by supporting First Amendment Radio. Now, we're talking... Oh, and by the way, if you'd like to email me, I haven't given my email address in a long time. It's tom at seawaves.us. That's tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. Okay? So now, we'll continue. Roman Catholic Portugal revolted against the papacy the temporal power of the Pope. It says, In Portugal, revolution had ended in civil war and the complete subjugation of the retrogressive papal party. They kicked the papists out. No more uh, papal interference in temporal affairs in Portugal. And not only did they stop the retrogressive monarchical party in Portugal, they suppressed the Jesuits. They kicked them out of the country. And they and they confiscated all their property. What what would happen in the United States if we did that? Think of it. Think of it. If America would man up, recognize who their enemies are, kick the papists out of the country, stop this retrogression, 
toward monarchical rule, kick the Jesuits out of this country and confiscate all their property. But only in Roman Catholic countries has this happened. It, it's, if you stop and think about it, it is incredible. It's shameful is what it is. That Protestant America doesn't have the fortitude to recognize who their enemy is and then take this pro this progressive action against this enemy in the United States. Port in Portugal, revolution had ended in civil war and the complete subjugation of the retrogressive papal party, the suppression of the Jesuits, and the confiscation of their property. Pope Gregory XVI and the supposed plentitude of his spiritual power had attempted to interfere and threatened the authors of this revolution with excommunication and other forms of pontifical malediction. But his curses only intensified the determination to put an end to retrogression so that Portugal could take her place among the progressive nations. Do you know what error Portugal made in its attempt to rise up to the progressive nations, to the Protestant nations, they continued, as did France, and as did Spain, and as did Italy, to recognize the Pope's spiritual power. They didn't have the, the biblical knowledge to understand that the papacy was no representative of Christ at all, but was the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. If they wanted their revolution to succeed, minimally they had to recognize that the Pope has no spiritual power either. But they failed to do it, and Portugal remains Catholic to this day. So, does Fr so is France and Spain and Italy. They may have their constitutional governments, but they are still Roman Catholics and subject to the excommunications and damnations and papal thunders. Slaves to the biblical Antichrist. It says in Spain, events of the same character were also transpiring. The Jesuits were again suppressed because they were the reputed authors of all public calamities, and even the nuncio of the Pope was expelled from the country. Roman Catholic Spain, the most Catholic country in the world, wholly dedicated to the spiritual power of the Pope, they wouldn't let the Pope have anything to do with their government. They did what every country on the planet except the United States has done. They kicked the Jesuits out of the country. They acknowledged the Jesuits as the authors of all their calamities. Would to God that the American people came to the same knowledge. He says, such examples as these occurring among kindred populations of the same religion, Roman Catholic, we're talking about Roman Catholic nations, could not fail to incite fresh hopes in the minds of those Italians who were not becoming timid and in renewing the courage of those who were. Nevertheless, the presence of the Austrians compelled them still longer to await the coming of future events, some of which were then beginning to, quote, cast their shadows before, unquote. We now reach a period when the scenes began to shift and new actors appeared, of whom thousands yet living at, at least at the time of the writing of this book, I'm sure none of them remain today, but he says, of whom thousands yet living have formed favorable or unfavorable opinions according to the standpoint from which they have, they have considered them. Pope Gregory the Sixteenth died in 1846, leaving the revolution unsuppressed, the storm still raging. He had been enabled by the presence of the Austrian army to prevent any formidable outbreak in the, effect, in the disaffected provinces, but could accomplish nothing more than to leave, his, leave to his successor, Pope Pius IX, the inheritance of temporal power, not merely threatened, but seriously imperiled. 
So Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, who's who remained upon his temporal throne only by the armed assistance of Austria, dies in office and leaves his successor in this well this this trauma, this threat. And how did Pope Pius the Ninth handle it? Well, let me remind my listeners before we even continue here that Pope Pius the Ninth ended by issuing another papal encyclical and which included what it, what is known in history as the syllabus of error, which condemned every form of popular government throughout the world. He was a Jesuit led divine right monarchist and he wished to restore monarchy all over the world, papal monarchy all over the world, condemned every form of popular government, condemned freedom of speech, condemned freedom of the press, condemned freedom of conscience, condemned freedom of religion. He literally restated all the tenets of, Vatic- of, uh, of the Council of Trent. And most of his damnations were aimed directly at the United States of America, because the papacy sees the United States as being the one who inspired all the other Roman Catholic nations of the world to likewise rebel against the papacy. That was Pope Pius IX, the successor of Pope Gregory XVI. But he started out appearing as a liberal, someone who would take the sting away from papal tyranny to lighten the load of the papal uh, iron chains that bound Italy. It says, he had been enabled by the presence... uh, Excuse me, let me continue here. He says, the condition of things existing at the time of the latter's election, that is, Pope Pius IX, cannot be more aptly described than in the language of a distinguished author who has written the life of Pope Pius IX, who says, quote, Gregory XVI was maintained on his throne during his reign of 15 years and a quarter, slowly by the, uh, solely by the force of Austrian bayonets. The report sent by the cardinals and the prelates entrusted with the government of the various provinces to headquarters at Rome abundantly proved the truth of this assertion. To cite these here would occupy more space than can be allowed to the subject and would be a manifold reiteration of the statement that the entire population was irrecon- uh, irreconcilably hostile to the apostolic government. The entire population was irreconcilably hostile to the papal government. And it says the revolt had indeed been crushed by the enormously superior force of the Austrian troops, but disaffection was of no degree extinguished. Conspiracy was chronic in all the cities of the pontifical dominions. Discovery, repression, and punishment were the principal occupations of the papal government. That's right, they went around just like the Inquisition and and arrested those who were in support of the rebellion and publicly killed them, hanging them on gibbets for public display. This is what will happen to you if you support this rebel outbreak in Italy. They tried to stop any discussion about forming a constitutional government. It says discovery, repression, and punishment were the principal occupations of the papal government and its agents during the whole of Pope Gregory XVI's reign, which may be said to have been one long struggle with conspiracy and revolution. The number of condemnations are alone sufficient to show that the countries subjected to the government of the apostolic court were in a condition which could not have endured but for the overpowering pressure of an external force, unquote. Austria. And it says, Pope Pius IX had a generous heart, was kindly disposed, and possessed many excellent personal qualities. After his election, a general disposition was exhibited among all classes 
except the extreme revolutionists, to wait his course of action, to await his course of action before pronouncing judgment upon his pontificate. So Pope Pius IX had the reputation of being somewhat progressive. And so because of this reputation that Pope Pius IX had upon his election as Pope, the people, the rebels, laid down their arms. And the only ones who continued to beat the drum of revolution were the extremists in this case, those who would make no compromise whatsoever with the Pope. But you can imagine that being threatened with Austrian bayonets and with all the public hangings that were taking place, that there were a lot of people that were just hopeful that that Pope Pius IX would, well, lighten up and would give make concessions and that the revolution would not be necessary. Okay, These were nominal revolutionists. And they were the majority of Italy. <clears throat> now it says, It was understood that among the conclave of cardinals assembled to elect a successor to Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, he had united with several others, that is, Pope Pius the Ninth had united with several others in a petition which favored reforms and improvement in the papal government. There was no strictly religious question to be settled as all were agreed with reference to these. In other words, R.W. Thompson is making it clear. This had nothing to do with the Christian faith, uh, as, as, as R.W. Thompson would describe it. I would describe it as there was no concern about the Catholic religion. Okay, this had nothing to do with the Catholic religion. This had, all had to do with government. And it says, and hence, as all the matters involved concerning temporal affairs alone, growing out of the revolution, a strong desire existed to give him the fullest opportunity to decide upon the means and measures of redress demanded by existing grievances. Even the extreme revolutionists were drawn to this policy by the general disposition to accept Pope Pius IX as in some sense a reformer, and to give him full time to mature such measures of reform as he deemed expedient. Considering the, the condition of things then existing, he came into power under circumstances which might easily have led to pacification, but for the adverse influence which he found himself in the end without power if he had the desire to counteract. He should not be judged too harshly, says R. W. Thompson, for there are very few who have not, some time or other, been confronted by conditions which, instead of their being able to control, controlled them. The question pending were not such as the, the European sovereigns would allow to be considered Italian questions alone. If they had been, he might have found it in his power to gratify his natural desire for peace and quiet throughout all the Italian provinces. But from the date of the Holy Alliance, the supporters of monarchism had assumed that all such questions possessed an international character, which entitled the sovereigns to interfere in the temporal and domestic affairs of any European state, so as to suppress by military force any popular effort to establish constitutional governments. Pope Gregory XVI, besides his general acquiescence, had given his express pontifical sanction to this principle, first by invoking the aid of the King of France, and then by inviting the Austrian army into Italy. And whatsoever may have been the inclination of Pope Pius IX, he had to encounter, at the beginning of his pontificate, difficulties of no ordinary magnitude. Even the conclave of cardinals which elected him contained two parties, the absolutists, and the liberals. The lines separating them were distinctly marked, and each party had its candidate. The absolutists, wedded to the retrogressive policy of Pope Gregory XVI, favored the Cardinal Lambruschini, 
because as Secretary of State under Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, he was strongly in favor of and had given direction to the policy. The diplomatic representatives of all the governments except France took the same side because it promised pontifical aid to monarchism and of opposition to liberalism and progress. Pope Pius IX, as Cardinal Masti, has never been charged with having endeavored to promote his own election, but having been supported by the liberal cardinals and the French ambassador, he acquired the reputation of favoring reform in the existing order of affairs, and doubtless deserved it. His election, consequently, was considered a triumph of liberalism over absolutism. Now, we're going to get into this more deeply, but what you are going to find is that Pope Pius IX was no less absolutist than was Pope Gregory the Sixteenth. He only appeared to be liberal to keep the papacy from coming under attack by exciting the revolutionist spirit in Italy. He had to appear to be liberal to postpone the inevitable and to give the papacy time to gather up strength for a final assault against this revolution in Italy. Remember, Pope Pius IX was the author of the Encyclical and Syllabus of Error of 1864. He was a Jesuit-led monarchist, a divine right dictator, and he was no less an antichrist than was Pope Gregory XVI or any of the other previous popes throughout Roman Catholic history. Now, it says, by the time the policy of Gregory XVI had, quote, studded the country with gibbets, crowded the galleys with prisoners, and filled Europe with exiles, and almost every other home in the papal state with mourning, unquote. Among the middle class, there were few families not grieving at the absence of some of their family members, either imprisoned or sent to exile, only for desiring reform in the civil government. It is fair to suppose that Pope Pius IX, influenced by a kindly nature, sympathized with all these, says R.W. Thompson. Whether he did or not, however, he entered upon the second month of his pontificate by issuing a decree of amnesty, which opened the prison doors and brought back the exiles upon whom the heavy hand of his immediate predecessor had fallen. This was an amnesty for political offenses, and viewed in that light, is entitled to be regarded as an act credible, creditable to its author. In order to decide, however, what was the precise character and effect, and how subsequent events were molded by it, its terms and conditions must be observed. Its general purport was sufficiently comprehensive to embrace all classes of political prisoners and offenders except ecclesiastics. Now, remember, the priests are never subject to the civil power. Okay, They're under the, the sole jurisdiction of the papacy. So the ecclesiastics are left out of this. And it says, But it required that in consideration of the clemency granted them that they should, quote, listen to this, make in writing a solemn declaration on their honor that they would not in any manner or at any time abuse this grace and will for the future fulfill the duties of a good and faithful subject, unquote. So you want this amnesty? You have to sign this piece of paper guaranteeing that you will cease and desist your revolution against the temporal power of the Pope. That's what this amounts to. And it says a written declaration was required, which was intended to be explanatory, but was somewhat broader in terms. It required that Pope Pius IX should be recognized as the quote-unquote lawful sovereign, that is, the lawful king, and that the disturbances made by the revolution should be condemned for having, quote, attacked the lawfully constituted authority 
of his temporal dominions, unquote. So they had to put down this revolution if they wanted uh, amnesty. So where's the conciliatory nature in this? Where is the liberal tendency being expla- uh, displayed by Pope Pius IX? This is all a pretense. And it says, this meant, of course, the recognition of the old order of things, except insofar as Pope Pius IX, whose temporal authority as king was, pre- was preserved, should think proper of his own accord to introduce reforms. It was not understood to mean a continuance of an entire retrogressive policy of Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, because underlying the fact of amnesty, the personality of Pope Pius the Ninth and his supposed tendency toward liberalism had to be considered in interpreting it. That being the view taken of it, and this latter consideration having furnished the ground of hope in the future, the amnesty was generally accepted and shoutings, rejoicings, and todayums were heard in all directions in the provinces as well as at Rome. The only visible exception among the Italians were the extreme revolutionists who would be reconciled to nothing but the absolute destruction of the temporal power of the Pope by the separation of the church from the state and the, and the formation of a constitutional government. They were not sufficiently numerous, however, to give direction to the general sentiment, and matters progressed with a seeming quietude which had not existed for a long time. In other words, the Pope bought some time by this amnesty, and everybody fell for it except for the extreme revolutionists who were a minority and who could not raise a strong enough voice to persuade the people to reject this phony pretense put forward by Pope Pius IX. All right, we've run out of time. This hour, this program sometimes should be two hours long, but I, my voice can only take one hour at a time, so we're going to quit for today. We'll be back tomorrow on Inquisition Update and continue where we left off. The Attempted Revolution of Roman Catholic Italy against the temporal power of the Pope as presented by R.W. Thompson. We'll see you tomorrow. Visit crosstheborder.org C-R-O-S-S crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. That's crosstheborder.org I know you all want answers and believe me, so do I and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicholas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicholas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about God's chosen people and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.